Good morning and welcome to the first session on macroeconomics. This is a very, very interesting concept and an interesting sector to know about in economics. Now, macroeconomics is a very, very important concept because we are going to talk about the nation as a whole. In microeconomics, we were talking about an individual. But in macroeconomics, we are going to talk about the country as a whole. India as a country, India's problems, India's growth, India's challenges and all the factors put together. So macroeconomics is a collective function and it's going to address the country as one single sector altogether. So moving forward, let's try to understand what are the factors that make this macroeconomics altogether. Now, if you go through the macroeconomics, you will start understanding the different factors that are available or that are there in the country. The first one, economy of the country. We're going to talk about growth. We're going to talk about employment. We're going to also talk about economic agents. Now, if you see that, there are certain common words that are being used in economics, like GDP, unemployment, inflation, money, the consumer price index. So there are so many factors, so many terms that are being talked about in macroeconomics. We will try to understand each and every one of them individually in detail. Now, let's start with the economy of the country. India as a country is known for its rich heritage, culture, as well as for the economy. It's said to be the second most emerging nation in terms of economic development. So the word economy is very, very important for us. We are not a country which has just come up through any other means or through any other practices. We are a country which has been recognized in the world for our skills for our abilities, for our production capacity, for the knowledge that the country possesses. So the economy of a country is the most dynamic part. And India as a country is known for its dynamism in terms of production, in terms of all the skills and abilities that we have gathered to become the powerhouse of economics. Now, the growth factor in India. If you look at the macroeconomic status of our country, India has grown leaps and bounds in terms of its growth. Starting from the independence till today, that is 2020, India has made a very, very steady progress in every single sector that it has attended. Starting from agriculture, moving to manufacturing, then to services, into every single sector that you can talk about, India's growth has been a steady and a rapid progress altogether. So the Indian economy is very, very interesting. Why? Because we have struggled for our freedom. We have struggled to make our country really economically superpowered, self-sustaining, and we have overcome every single challenge that you can see in the world. And we have today come to a position where everybody looks India as an example of growth, as a factor that needs to be followed, as a country that needs to be taken as an example and move forward. Now, the employment factor, this has been a very, very important concept for a country like India. When we are talking about a population of 135 crores in India, population and the employment are two importantly linked. So unemployment and employment are the factors that have been talked in our country day in and day out. So when we talk about this word employment, are we able to provide job for all the 135 crore people? Now, assuming that among the 135 crore people, about 60 crore people are the persons who are available as labor, as manpower, who can contribute to the growth of the nation. The question that immediately comes is that, are we able to provide employment to the 60 crore people in our country? The answer is definitely no. But then the country has made a steady progress, has made a step by step effort to make all the 60 crore people employable in nature. When we started to grow with agriculture as the base for development, we tried to involve every single person into that factor. But unfortunately, agriculture was not really accepted in India as a sector altogether. 
Then when we started moving towards manufacturing, the employment rate started moving up by 30%. After manufacturing, when we started to come towards the service sector altogether, the employment rate started growing over 60%. So today, if you see in India, we have more than 70% of the population concentrated in manufacturing and services sector. And the remaining percentage concentrated in the agriculture. So the employment factor in India when it comes to the macroeconomic level, it's quite interesting to know because we have a set of population that is well versed, educated, skilled and capable of taking any kind of job. So India becomes a destination where people will give the outsourced job plus India can also create jobs for those millions of youth. So our economy is such a diverse and dynamic economy that we are able to create and as well as take up the challenges that are coming towards our country. That's the most important factor that we need to understand from the employment perspective. Now, the economic agents, who are the economic agents? Economic agents are the people, institutions, organization, government who all involve themselves in the factor of decision making. Now for a large and diversified country like India, we need a lot of people, we need a lot of decision makers, we need a lot of organization, individual heads who can help the country to become the next best country in the world. So there what happens is that people want to know who can take the decision, how the decisions can be implemented, how the decisions can really prove to be effective to the country. So what we do is that we involve the economic agents like RBI, like the government of India, like the ministers, everybody start involving themselves, including the planning commission of India is one of the primary economic agents who try to drive the nation forward. If there be an economic crisis, if there is some challenge, if there is some need where India needs to propel itself to the future, then there is always a need for economic agents. So all the economic agents try to make an effort by which the nation can move forward. We have always believed that the country will have challenges in terms of the economy. But we are a country who will always say challenge accepted and we start moving forward. We never go back. We never say that we are afraid of challenges. We have the economic agents who try to understand, analyze the problem and come up with apt, feasible solutions that can make the country move forward as a nation together. So that's why the role of economic agents in macro economy is very, very important. If you look into the picture, you will have a lot of factors like GDP, inflation, money, consumer price index. All these factors are something that are inbuilt for every country. It is not only for India. It is not only for any other country like specifically speaking about UK or USA or Japan. It is for every single country in this world. So what do these factors mean? They are all important factor. They are all an integral factor of any macro economy. So every time when a country tries to understand its macro economy, these functions or these factors are inbuilt. You need to address them. You need to take care of them. Then only there will be an economic progress. Every country will try to make a progress in some or the other line feasible. But then if you want to make an economic progress, if you want to make your country the number one country in the world, if you want to make everybody believe that economic growth is present in this country, that means you need to address all these problems. So that is why macro economy is a collection. It is not an individual issue. It is about every single citizen of this country every single person who tries to contribute to the growth of the nation. So that's why it is very, very important for all of us to study macroeconomics and understand the growth of the nation. Moving forward, economy as a whole or the wealth of the nation. This is what we are going to really look into before we start getting into it. Adam Smith and macroeconomics. It's a very, very important concept. Now, 
the genius or the founder of economics, Adam Smith, the father of economics. He was the person who gave the wonderful book called as The Wealth of the Nation. So we need to understand from the previous slide, as I was trying to say, economy as the whole, and that was given in The Wealth of the Nations. The founder of economics, Adam Smith, tried to speak and address this issue. He was trying to say in the book, The Wealth of the Nation, how a country starts growing with all its capital, with all its inputs put together and start moving together as an integrated nation and start making a progress. So the concept of wealth of nations itself is a very, very important topic. Wealth does not mean just money. Wealth does not mean just assets. Wealth does not mean that individual factors. Wealth means a collective effort all put together that makes a nation start moving forward now wealth and welfare these are two important words that we are going to learn in macroeconomics today when i use the word wealth probably the first word or the first thing that rings in your mind is money naturally wealth has always been characterized as money so anybody when they talk about this word wealth the word money comes into picture. But then in economics, we are talking about assets. We are talking about the capabilities. We are talking about all the collective factors that a nation has. Now, for example, India. India is such a diverse nation where you find a lot of diversity, not only in people, but also in the natural resources. In certain parts of India, we get natural resources like minerals, like copper, for example, we can talk about metal, we can talk about zinc, we can talk about all those important metals that are needed for the growth of the country. We also have a reserve for precious metals like gold, silver. We also have a reserve for oil and petroleum. So India as a country is a collective resource. It is blessed with all kind of natural resources in different parts put together. So that constituency factor, the collective factor of saying that things putting together, that contributes to the wealth of the nation. The wealth is not a singular factor. The wealth is a collective factor of all the 135 crore people living in this country. So that is where wealth becomes a collective asset. It is every single person's effort that goes into the nation in order to create such a wealth for the country. So it is very, very important for us to understand that the country is actually a gift of the people. We have all worked together in order to create such a great nation. So we need to be really careful and we really need to understand our country as an economic resource altogether. Now the welfare, the welfare of the people comes by the wealth created and by the work that we have done for the country. Many a times we ask, what has the country done for us? To answer to this question, the country has given us a lot of resources, starting from employment, starting from policies that are beneficial for our people, and starting from all the good things that the government has done, it is for the social benefit and for the welfare of our people. Now, when I use the word welfare, it is about the amenities, it is about the facilities that the country has created and given to the people. So it is very, very important that the word welfare is always linked with wealth. There are many countries in the world which are rich, which have enough amount of money, which have enough amount of resources. But are the people being taken care? Are the rights of the people being looked into? Are the benefits being given to the people? That is a very, very important question. In India, we make it sure that every single citizen is being given his basic rights. His welfare is taken into account. So India is a country that has rightly understood the word wealth and welfare. We have combined the two factors. We have made it count that every single country should look into India and understand the growth, not only in terms of money, but in terms of mind. 
but in terms of ethics, in terms of values, in terms of principles. So we were the country who had given to the world the concept of wealth and welfare combined. Moving forward, the social goals. Social goals are very, very important. Why? Because when you live in a country like India, the society is a large word. It's a collection of n number of individuals. And we in India have different types of society. A society which is based on caste, creed, age, color. So many factors are there. Now these are all terms that are put together to make the country look as a collective organization. The social goals of each and every society, those who are involved in our country are different, are unique. But as a country, as India, we have always tried to address every single society and try to make a collective benefit altogether. So the social goals of the country also needs to be addressed in a macroeconomic manner. This was already spoken by Adam Smith in The Wealth of the Nations. But then India made a collective effort, a conscious effort to see that every single society in India is always benefited. And that is the reason we are a people who believe that unity in diversity, that concept is very well built in the Indian economic system. Now, wages, interest, output and employment, these are some factors that we are going to learn in macroeconomics. Why? Because when we talk about wages, when we talk about interest, when we talk about output and employment, these are all factors that really make a difference for our country. Now, in a country like India, what is the salary? At what rate do we pay salary? What is the interest rate? What is the production rate? All these factors are a very, very big question. Why? Because people are interested to know. Everybody is being paid at a particular level based on their skill, based on their ability, based on their experience and knowledge. So now what happens is that the concept of wages, the concept of interest, the concept of how much output and production is being determined are all a very big macro concept put together. So you need to understand each and everything in detail and start moving forward. So for a person who is trying to understand our country, who is trying to understand the economy of India, it's a very big mission altogether. India is not like any other nation where macro economy can be just spoken in one line. But here the macro economy has to be understood from 29 states and the six union territories which means it's a massive combination of different factors put together. So that's why Concepts like wages, interest, output, employment or production is not so easy for an Indian economy. It is a lot and a big complex factor put together. But anyway, taking the help from Adam Smith and taking some ideas from wealth of the nation, we have definitely progressed and we have created our own repository of knowledge and examples put together to make macroeconomics look better for the nation. Now, moving forward, we are now going to talk about a very, very important person whom I would call as the father of modern macroeconomics or I would simply put the word the father of modern economics. We have spoken about Adam Smith in the last slide. So we have the picture of Adam Smith, the person who wrote The Wealth of Nation. We also have a very great economist and also a Nobel laureate, J.M. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the founder of modern macroeconomics. He wrote the book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. This is a very, very important book. Rather, I would say the milestone, the epitome of modern macroeconomics. Why? Because when this book was published in the year 1936, this book turned the entire way economics have to be looked forward. John Maynard Keynes was the first person who had tried to emphasize upon the factor called as employment and production including interest and money factor. After the depression of America, which we are going to see in the coming slides, after the depression that happened in America, it was John Maynard Keynes who took forward, who took the initiative 
of making macroeconomics very, very important for any nation's development. Now, how did that happen? If you look into any of the country today, what is the single most factor that makes a country grow? And the answer to it is employment. If you have a labor workforce that is 100% employed, then automatically you can say that the output or the income that has been earned is also on the higher scale. Now, if you look at most advanced nations like the UK, USA, Russia, Japan, Israel, all these kind of countries, they all have their employment rate at the highest possible. Now, what kind of job do they do is secondary. But what is primary is that every single person in this country tries to involve himself in some kind of job. There are people in the country who do multiple jobs. That's another factor. But then when a person gets involved in some kind of job, automatically the productivity goes up, the income goes up, the output of the nation goes up. So that factor was clearly underlined by J.M. Keynes. He went ahead and he made it a point to every single economist, to every single citizen, government in this world, saying that you need to start providing higher levels of employment. You need to start making people believe the factor that they have to get into a job, they have to produce something, and the output will be counted for the growth of the nation. So that's a very, very important concept that we need to understand. So when we start talking about the general theory of employment, it is not just employment. I would use the word engagement. You have to engage people into work. Only when they are employed fully, the nation will continue to grow. So that fantastic concept, that fantastic idea was given by the great economist J.M. Keynes. And this was published in the year 1936, which became the Bible of economics, which I would say the epitome of economics altogether. Now, moving forward, we would like to talk about an event that really depressed the entire world. It's a very sad event, but then this event was a turning point in economics altogether. What was that event? That event was known as the Great Depression of America. Did America ever go into depression? The answer is yes. Why? Because people always look at America as a greenish country, as a country which is ever grown, superpower country, a capitalistic that has never accepted defeat in the world. That's what is the image of America in the world. But then this country, this great country also went into depression in the year 1929. And this year was very, very important because in the year Following this, 1930, John Maynard Keynes came into picture and he bought in the macroeconomics. But then, now let's try to understand what is this Great Depression of America. A year when the entire America was ripped apart, was torn into pieces in terms of economic downturn. So there was a heavy loss of jobs, food problem, loss in production, markets were completely destroyed. So the people were left with no options. You would see that it was drought everywhere, no food availability, employment was not there, production houses are running dry, no money with the government, the company and the organizations are completely left out with no option. A macroeconomic situation to the world's largest superpower which they were left without a single option in the world. That was the Great Depression. Depression. A Great Depression where the entire American citizens felt that was the end of the world. But then they always had an option. They had an idea. They had a vision how to take it forward. And that's where John Maynard Keynes came forward and he started writing the book called as the General Theory of Employment. And after the 1930s, say about 34, 35 in that period, America again started moving forward and afterward it was no looking back. They started becoming the economic superpower of the world. But what is very, very important for us is that any depression, any emergency, any kind of situations that you are witnessing today has always a turn has always a positive side also. So this is never the end of the world. Macroeconomics always tells us that whenever there is an emergency, 
whenever there is a downturn, whenever there is a depression, whenever there is a fallout that happens for a country, any country in the world, something positive will also happen following it. So that is what has been spoken in the Great Depression of America. When people lost jobs, when people did not have food, when people did not have any production houses running, when the companies were completely left apart, there was a solution where people started to pull back the economy. They again pumped money into the economic system. They started making up new kind of job. Employment started coming up. The production houses again started producing and they slowly pulled the economy back and they became a superpower. So that's the exact same situation which I would like to discuss for our country today. Today what we are facing is just a minute situation. It is a situation, yes, we have come down in terms of economic. There is some depression that's happening in our current scenario. But that is not the end of the economy. We will again pull back and we will again come back. And we will also rewrite the history saying that the next economic superpower in the world will be India. And that is possible when we start emphasizing ourselves when we start focusing ourselves on employment when we start focusing ourselves on production so the great depression of america is not just a story it's not just an event to be written on the pages of history but it is that factor it is that situation it is that moment that everybody needs to understand analyze and take it forward. It is a lesson for every single economist, every single citizen, every single professionist in this world so that to make them understand, to motivate themselves back thinking on this factor that every depression will come back with something positive. After the storm comes the calm. So that's exactly Great Depression of America taught us. It taught us to come back, to stand on our feet and create a better and positive world all together. So moving forward. Now we are going to talk about the present context of macroeconomics. What is the present context of macroeconomics? Where is the world heading towards? Where is India heading towards? What are the global countries thinking? What do they think in terms of macroeconomic concept? It's quite interesting and quite informative and valuable also. The first thing, capitalistic countries. When America got its freedom and started moving forward, it believed the way of growth is capitalism, which means give more emphasis, importance to private organization, never depend upon the government. You try to create your own wealth. You try to create your own asset. You start becoming competitive from day one. You are not going to depend on anybody. Don't wait for decisions to happen. Make the decision by yourself. Go forward. Today, as we talk about Make in India, they had already discussed about it, Make in USA. So similarly, now most of the countries want to become capitalistic countries. They want to have their own decision-making units. They want to go forward in the competitive manner. They don't want to be stay. They don't want to relax back by any policies or by any rules and regulation. They just want to be competitive. They just want to go forward. They want to showcase their skills and talents. They want to make their country as a global platform, as an area where they can display their talent as an area where they can display the strength and skill. So similarly in India, we are also trying to make ourselves as an individual country where we can go forward, showcase our talent, showcase our knowledge, showcase our ability and say that we are the best country in the world. So we are now capitalistic in thinking. We have not become a capitalistic economy, but we have become capitalistic in thinking. We just want to go forward, tell the world that yes, we can do it. The second factor, natural resources. India is a country which is blessed with natural resources. We have some of the best rivers in the world, the mountains, the greenery, everything we have. What is that we are trying to look into? We want to make the best use of environment without causing much damage. Now, because when we start understanding about the concept of natural resources itself, it is very, very important that we be cautious in using them and we be judicial in terms of making a productive use of it. 
So when we talk about this word natural resources from a macroeconomic standpoint, we need to understand that they are not available for a regular use. We cannot just go and deplete them as and when we want. What we need to do is that we need to protect the natural resources and grow with them. So at a point, we need to understand why natural resources really matter to the nation. There are many countries in the world who are economically superior, technically superior, but they don't have natural resources like India. So they have to depend on imports. In that case, now for example, let me take Japan as a country. Japan is technically advanced nation. The fastest train in the world or probably the best electronics in the world has been invented by Japan. But then when it comes to natural resources, they don't have much because they are just four small tiny islands who have been constantly disturbed by earthquakes and volcanoes. But in India, we are a subcontinent. We have n number of natural resources. We have the capability. We have the productivity. It's only a matter of factor that we guide them properly. We use them judiciously and we take it forward. So natural resources are definitely a blessing in disguise. That will help us to grow the macro economy of the country. Next, entrepreneurs, not to forget, our country is today on the verge of creating the maximum entrepreneurship capital. Why is that needed? If you look at any of the advanced country, the question of employment and unemployment comes from entrepreneurship. If you believe that, you will still depend on the government to open up the doors and start providing employment to those millions and hundreds of people. It is not possible. There is a time that is needed and the time is now when you start creating that human capital with your effort, which means now you open up the doors, allow the ideas to come forward and create your own job. So we always believe that entrepreneurship is the foremost idea in terms of macroeconomics. Why? Because in macroeconomics, we believe more the employment, more the human capital utilization, the growth will also be successful. So we are being creating a platform for all the entrepreneurs where they can come forward, where they can put their ideas and they can provide job to millions of people across the globe. So more the entrepreneurial capacity that shows the dynamism in terms of economics, that shows the capacity that your country has the power to give employment to millions of people across the globe. So that is very, very important. You are able to harness the talent of people and put it together and start making your economy propel further. Last but not the least, the revenue and expenditure. For every country, there is something in addition, there is something on the subtraction part also. So there is a revenue, there is some expenditure, there is some income, there is some spending for that. So now what we talk about here in terms of macroeconomics, the revenue and expenditure is very, very important. How much revenue are we able to generate for our country? Is it that we are able to just generate revenue for our day-to-day -day living? Are we looking as a visionary? Or are we just thinking about generating revenue for the, our basic income alone? So the concept of revenue is an unlimited concept. Every country wants to create an unlimited revenue source for themselves. And India is no way we are going back. We also want to be a country where we can create an unlimited source of revenue. We want our nation to be the number one country in the world where revenue can be maximum. We also want to do expenditure and this expenditure which I am telling you is a meaningful expenditure. We want to invest in certain sectors that will add benefit to our country. We are not just going to spend money as and when we want. We want to put in that money. We want to invest on certain sectors so that that expenditure adds certain benefit. That expenditure is a meaningful expenditure in the long run. So in coming back to the macroeconomic concept, the revenue and expenditure are two important factors that will definitely decide the growth of the nation. Moving forward. Now, we are going to talk about certain concepts in economics to the nation, something like wage rate, labor problems, and then we are going to talk about production units, government and investment factor. Now, when we talk about this wage rate, 
India as a country, as I have told you always, is a sector where we try to see that we can give our employees the maximum benefit, where we can try to give our employees the maximum growth or the source altogether. There are many labor problems that are available in our country, but that is quite common for any other nation in the world. Why do you see that labor problems coming up? Is because that we are not able to provide employment to every single sector. But then the answer to that comes from the production unit. We want to set up better manufacturing units that can provide employment so that the problems of wage rate and labor can be solved. The only way of increasing and you know employment rate altogether is to increase the production. The more the manufacturing unit, more number of people will get employed, automatically the unemployment problem will be solved and at the same time all of them will also start generating income. So we are concentrating on production units. When we have listened to our Prime Minister talking about make in India, this is the concept on which the macroeconomics is moving. We want every single product to be made in India. We want every single factory to be created in India from a macroeconomic perspective. Why? Because the unemployment problem can be solved. So more we start creating production units, automatically everybody will get job, the wage rate problem will also come down and then we can also start becoming an economic superpower. The government factor. The government is a neutral factor when it comes to macroeconomics. Why? Because government is only an enabler. We cannot say government is the root cause. Government is an enabler. The government will try to provide us platform. The government's ideology is that they want to provide platform for people so that they can come and perform. The government's ideology is that they want to provide a lot of facilities to the people where they can come up with the idea and they can give a better economic shape to the country. So in our country, now the government is trying to become flexible. The government is trying to bring in factors like public-private partnership, partner in different types of projects and activities and promote employment altogether. So when we start looking at the macroeconomic to the nation, the government is trying to become helpful. The government is trying to become flexible. And the most important thing, the government is trying to become participative in every single project, in every single activity that is going on. So that way, the government will try to push the economy forward and try to make us understand the need for growth. The investment factors. Now, government would have identified certain sectors for growth. That might be education, defense, healthcare, or it might be in terms of chemicals, banking, agriculture. So many factors where the government decides that they want to put in money so that the future growth can happen. But then investment factor is very, very important. Why? Because it is not just about putting money there. It is about creating a viable source from there. It should also create an income plus it should also create a growth for the people. So when the government decides on investment factors, they choose it very carefully where they try to understand the people, where they try to understand the growth perspective, where they try to match the skill with the growth altogether. So what happens in India is that we try to understand. Suppose in the government of India decides that they are going to spend 10,000 crores tomorrow on some national highway project where they're going to invest on infrastructure. They immediately see the benefit that is going to come out. It is not just about building roadways or bridge or highways. It is all about investing for the future that can give you a bright return. So the concept of investment when it comes to macroeconomics is always a very serious thought process which involves each and every micro molecule to be involved. It, it has a lot of thought process, it has a lot of thinking that can make the nation bright and better in future. Now moving forward. The sectors of the economy, this is a very, very important concept altogether. What are the sectors of the economy? The household sector, the external sector, exports and imports. These are a factor of the external sector itself.
but then we are going to talk about the sectors individually now when i talk about the household sector we call them as the consumption sector and also the sector that provides the labor so the household sector is a very big sector and a majority sector that we talk about in any of the economy now when you have a population of 130 crore plus in a country you can imagine the amount of consumption the amount of demand that has been created in terms of consumption so the household sector is the largest sector for a country like india there are a lot of people who contribute to this household sector it is not just about the person who is earning income but it is also about the person who consumes so the household sector has been given a topmost priority by the government they try to understand the needs, the wants of the household sector and always try to create a policy for them in such a way that it is beneficial. So if you look for example, any of the schemes that has been bought up by the present government has always tried to focus for the benefit of it be it a healthcare plan, be it an LPG gas plan or opening up of an account or providing them free ration. All these kind of factors are kept in mind with the household sector. They should be benefited because they are the people who drive the nation forward by consumption. So it is very, very important at any given point of time, we cannot afford forgetting the household sector. Followed by the household sector, we have the external sector. The external sector is the production, is the unit that starts getting into the imports and exports. They are the person who produce the goods, who push the goods towards the household sector. It's a cyclic nature altogether. The external sector works in demand for the household sector. So they produce the goods, they produce the necessary items that are needed for the growth. So altogether, if you see that the concept of exports and import is very much an integral part of any nation. The more you export the revenue, the more you import, you spend. So automatically now what happens here is that the consumption factor, the demand factor, the supply factor, all of them get integrated in macroeconomics. So every single microeconomic concept is also inbuilt in the macroeconomic concept. So the macroeconomic tries to cover every part of the economy. With this, I would like to come to the conclusion of the session. I hope and believe that the session was interesting, informative and educative. Macroeconomics is the base for any economy for the country to grow. So it is very, very important that we understand every single concept in macroeconomics. By saying this, I would like to say thank you and thanks for joining me on this wonderful session. This was really a great and an interesting session for me too. Hope to see you again in the next session. Thank you once again.